Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Tom Kent, who teaches about Russian affairs and disinformation at Columbia University. He was also president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty until 2018. Previously, he was Moscow bureau chief, international editor and standards editor of the Associated Press. And this is Tom Kent's second appearance on the Cognitive Crucible. Tom Kent, welcome back to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks. It's nice to be back. The conversation I'd like to have with you today, Tom, will cover persuasion in the developing world. But before we get into these topics, could we start off by hearing your observations on Russia's war on Ukraine? And by the way, we'll have a link in the show notes to an article that you wrote recently entitled Russian Propagandists Regain Footing on Ukraine. Right. Well, just looking at the war as a whole at the moment, it seems to be pretty much a war of attrition. Doesn't seem that any side is about to bring any spectacular new weapons that are, will change the landscape substantially. Um, the Ukrainians are taking very heavy losses. The Russians are too, but they're a bigger country and have more people to shovel into it. As for the terms of engagement, NATO seems to, to be intent on not attacking Russian forces or letting Ukrainian forces attack Russian territory. So while Ukraine's troops have a lot more motivation than the Russian forces. It, it's unclear to me how they're going to stop the steady grind of the Russian offense or free any areas that Russia's already seized. I suppose the most likely outcome at this point is a Ukraine that survives as an independent country but loses even more of its territory. Um, Ukraine can hope it will be able to save part of its Black Sea coast so it doesn't become totally landlocked. But even if it does, it will be eternally at the mercy of the Russian Navy. So Ukraine looks to be becoming a country very much diminished economically and strategically compared to before the invasion. Unless, of course, there's some deus ex machina development that, that substantially changes the military picture. You never say never with regard to wars. As for Russia, um, I think it's lost most of whatever moral authority it had in the world before this, which wasn't a lot, um, and will largely operate going forward as just the meanest guy on the block that countries will have to continue to reckon with. Um, it'll have a military that is essentially unbeaten, despite taking losses, very embarrassing losses in this war. It'll still be able to blackmail many countries um, over energy and other resources. Uh, it'll still be able to deploy mercenaries uh, around the world in pursuit of its political goals. Um, as for the West, it will look like uh, it ultimately backed down over Ukraine, that for all its rhetoric um, and even the weapons it sent, it wasn't willing to do anything that could lead to a face-off with the Russian military, and that basically carried the day. Um, there could be very good military reasons why the West hasn't done more, um, but I'm just talking about how it's going to look to public opinion. Um, but I think there's also a possibility that Russia itself will collapse uh, with all the stress of this, so that could change the equation yet again. Mm, right. Yeah, I should have mentioned to our audience, we are recording this on Tuesday, June the 14th, 2022. So this is about 110 days since the February invasion began. And um, in your article, Tom, uh, you seem to be issuing a kind of warning to the West that we need to be paying attention to Russia's information operations, which are being directed at audiences 
uh, globally, uh, including the developing world. Um, first of all, would you say that this this is a fair uh, read uh, out of your article? And second, um, what do you think Russia's goals might be along these lines? Uh, it's a fair read, absolutely. I think we need to pay attention to what they're doing uh, in developing countries. Their goals are for developing countries not to condemn Russia, at least beyond maybe a few words about, you know, well, we hope it all ends peacefully, but they, they want to prevent any denunciations of Russia. They want developing countries not to support sanctions and essentially to leave Western countries, which have been trying to isolate Russia, isolated themselves, looking like they're using Ukraine as just one more way to demand obedience from the developing world in the um, in the uh, colonialist way that um, that Western nations in the Russian view have been oppressing the developing world forever. And the Russians have had some pretty effective ways to spread their messages. Uh, in Africa, um, well, to begin with, uh, Russia pays a lot of attention to Africa. Putin had a big African summit in 2019. They're planning another one in St. Petersburg for this fall. Um, they have very substantially developed networks on social media uh, that they have used for anti-French narratives to try to undermine France's position in Africa. Uh, they've also used that network to pave the way for interventions by Wagner, the Russian military company, the, 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 the mercenaries they deploy to many African countries or a few African countries. Um, they, they, they run campaigns, they put up billboards praising Russia and Putin. So they have quite a network there. Same thing in the Mideast. Um, Russian information outlets have very extensive Arabic language operations. RT television in Arabic um, posts, I understand, about 15 times an hour on Facebook, extremely active. And in Latin America, Russia Today's um, Latin American service, Spanish language service, is highly successful, especially in Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, Colombia, um, a lot of people don't even realize that it's Russian. They just think it's some European or international broadcast operation. And the Russians play very skillfully and I think pretty cynically on uh, the mood in developing countries. The West's approach is development, that you know our goal is to provide aid and assistance and advice and so forth so these countries can develop. I don't think the Russians really care if they develop or not. Uh, they see these countries as a geopolitical and a natural resources chessboard for Russia to get what it can for itself and to cause problems for the West. And it's very easy for the Russians to stroke the already strong beliefs there that all their problems are due to Western countries um, Western countries with their, their failed democracies and their liberal values and their timid foreign policies, um, and to present Russia with China, their, their bagman, as the strong-handed traditional values anti-colonialist force that is going to finally join with developing countries and bring them prosperity and, and, and social order. Now, whether Russia uh, and China really are the answer to prosperity and social order or any kind of democracy is another matter, but these are the uh, lines that Russia has been advancing. Mm, right. Um, I think you touched on this just a little bit in your previous um, answer, but I wanted to ask this maybe in just a little bit of a different way. You know, one of my... Um, uh, previous episodes of the Cognitive Crucible that I've mentioned a number of times is one with a fellow named uh, Bob Jones, who works at uh, SOCOM. And Bob has developed a really interesting uh, governance model, which really tries to encourage decision makers and leaders to or, you know, empathize and, and really understand the perspective of other people. And they could be, you know, out groups, uh, terrorist groups, but um, other nations um, as well. And it's, he, he, he makes a, for me at least, a really convincing case that, 
um, we really do need to understand, you know, what has happened, what is happening uh, with, with other countries in order to engage more productively with them. And so, you know, through that lens, I guess I wanted to ask you um, about that. So, you know, how do you think the war looks to you know, African nations or you know, Middle Eastern nations and even Latin America. And so um, even if it weren't for Russia's information operations, which are most assuredly happening, um, how might they view the war based on their own histories and views of the world? Do you, do you understand what I'm asking there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's important to look at it that way. Well, let's look at how some of the perceptions of the war um, have uh, have changed in the past few months, particularly in developing countries. Um, the Russian international propaganda machine, which I was just talking about all its assets uh, a few minutes ago, uh, was actually caught flat-footed by this invasion, mm. uh, as, as we, we believe is the case. Um, uh, very few people outside Putin's tightest inner circle knew they were really going to invade. And it looked like the, the Russian uh, information outlets didn't get the memo. So uh, they were stuck uh, when that invasion took place. I don't think they could believe it themselves. Uh, it's very hard just out of the box to justify the bloody invasion of another country. Also, the um, all these outlets have been saying, echoing the Kremlin, that there would be no invasion of Ukraine. So they've been all caught up in lying. So this was a problem. Uh, and for about two weeks after the invasion, they um, they basically sort of treaded water, just basically covering Kremlin statements and, and statements by other countries, including denunciations of Russia. They just didn't really know what to do. And all the images that were out there in, in the Western countries and in developing countries too, were all pretty pro-Ukraine. The tractor pulling the Russian tank, uh, Putin sitting at this ridiculous table uh, trying to control the war. Um, the Academy Awards had the moment of silence for Ukraine. The Pope kissed the, Ameri the, uh, the Ukrainian flag. Uh, celebrities endorsed Ukraine. Ukraine won the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, and I think everywhere the reaction was to get with a winner, which seemed to be Ukraine at this point. Um, and in, in, in UN votes, um, most developing countries voted to condemn the Russian invasion. Uh, and a lot of developing countries have, especially in Africa, have very strong feelings about violating international borders. So they were not out of the box, um, very kindly inclined, inclined toward this. It was a very sympathetic David versus Goliath story for, for most countries. Um, and even now, very few people actually think the Russian invasion was a good idea. But as it's dragged on, people in a lot of places uh, have begun to look at the war through the lenses through which they look at everything else involving Russia and Western countries. So the, um, the Russians have made a big point now that their um, propaganda machine has recovered, uh, make a big point about uh, their fighting neocolonialism. Now, Putin, of course, is a neocolonialist here trying to seize Ukraine, but as they describe it, it's the West that's try to trying to colonize Ukraine and Putin is fighting to, uh, to prevent that Western encroachment on Ukraine. And as soon as you say neocolonialism, that strikes a very responsive chord uh, in much of the uh, developing world. Um, places like South Africa, places like India are very responsive to that argument. Most of the developing world has not uh, joined sanctions against Russia, which is the same thing that happened after 2014, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, many, many developing countries uh, didn't join the sanctions against Russia at that point. Um, in Africa in particular, uh, of, of the 54 African countries, 25 abstained on condemning the Russian invasion at the UN, even though developing world um, feeling was anti-Russian as a whole, Africa was somewhat of an exception. And people in some countries like Ethiopia uh, were actually volunteering to, to fight with the Russians. Um, so the Russians have been encouraging feelings that the West suddenly wants Africa and Latin America and the Mideast to snap to um, and, um, and join the Western campaign against Russia over Ukraine when um, a lot of people in the developing world 
uh, are very skeptical of American and Western motives um, after Iraq, after Afghanistan, uh, on the Palestinian issue, on Yemen. Uh, they see Western countries pouring aid into Ukraine, but not uh, helping them, in their view, uh, to the same degree. Um, so uh, all their sort of suspicions and discomfort about the West come to the fore here. And as for Ukraine, I don't think most of them know very much about Ukraine. Most Americans don't know very much about Ukraine. Um, so they may be well willing to believe that maybe it is just a rebellious province. You know, in Africa, they, they know about rebellious provinces. They may believe that the um, Ukrainian government is fascist and that it's armed to the teeth by the West. And as for atrocities, um, you know, the Russians have argued that, um, you know, the atrocities were actually committed by Ukraine and who can know and, you know, um, you know, there are a lot of atrocities around uh, in the developing countries. It doesn't perhaps uh, strike the chord uh, that, it, that it does with us in the Ukraine situation. Also, there were widespread reports that, um, that the Ukrainians were, were quite hostile to African students in Ukraine who were trying to get out of, of Ukraine and made them walk when others were allowed to ride. So, you know, that tinge of racism is additionally uh, effective in, in developing countries and making Ukraine look like a, uh, a country that does not deserve their support. Um, and, and then as in every country, uh, people in developing nations worry first about their own concerns, uh, about economic dislocation, inflation, food. A lot of countries rely on Russia for fertilizers, for energy. Um, so, um, uh, Russia, uh, Russia today claims that uh, five African countries are threatened by famine. Some South American countries are too. And so, you know, uh, I think the vision from the from the um, from the developing world is that given the West's reluctance to confront Russian troops or the Russian Navy or let Ukraine strike Russian territory, you know, the only way this is going to stop is by Ukraine backing down. Um, and then the Russians will stop blocking the grain and maybe, you know, the economic crisis will, will uh, diminish. So you, you said a lot there, Tom. Uh, a couple of things stand out to me. So it sounds to me like you're saying that you know, Russia is combining legitimate grievances that uh, the developing world has with the United States and the West, and so they're they're pushing those buttons with their messages, and they're combining it with like what did you say a, a neo-colonialism uh, message as well, and so together that is something that we should be sitting up and paying attention to. It sounds like it does. Now, this doesn't mean that um, all is lost or anything. It doesn't mean that countries think Russia is a positive influence overall but their people do. I mean, there are polls uh, around the world that show very sharp declines in the reputation of Putin and the reputation of Russia. Um, nobody loves Russia, I don't think, in most developing countries, most of them at least. Uh, they don't really know Russia. Um, the, the, the culture of the West, the music of the West, the celebrities of the West are pervasive around the world. Um, but Russia can be useful to some governments in developing countries. Uh, by playing footsie with Russia, they get the attention of the US and the West and get aid and, and so forth. And the Russians do add stability to some places. Um, uh, France is pulling its forces out of Africa where they've traditionally backed governments in power and they fought guerrilla movements. Now with the, with the Russians, uh, I'm sorry, with the French pulling out of Africa, uh, it's Russian mercenaries who are moving into places like the Central African Republic and Mali. And the image of the Russians is these are tough guys and if they're on your side. They'll do whatever's necessary to make your side wins. Um, they, they may not be big on the human rights uh, uh, side. Uh, Russian mercenaries were, were recently reported to have been involved in quite a massacre of um, opposition people in Mali. But, you know, um, they, uh, they get the job done. Uh, and if you're, if you're running uh, natural resources in an African country and uh, you expect a major bribe in order to uh, 
um, make the contract uh, happen, uh, you're much more likely to get that from the Russians than you are from the Americans. I see. So you were the president of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty from uh, 2016 to 2018. Plus, you've, as we mentioned at the top, you've had a significant tenure with the Associated Press. You know, sticking with the Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty and the overall uh, U.S. Agency for Global Media, what role do you think that that organization should be playing right now in helping to further our interests or to manage the situation? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that um, by law, um, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Voice of America are are not government messengers. They're not the voice of the United States. Uh, their job is not really to advance particular U.S. government policies or argue for them. They're supposed to present programming, I think the law says, in accord with the broad um, thrust of U.S. foreign policy. But uh, they are not the ones uh, who are supposed to be out there you know, arguing. Um, they're, they're supposed to be presenting news and information and in a very American way. We trust that uh, if if proper news and information is provided to people, that they will um, think more uh, in our in our way than they think in the way of our adversaries. And within that mandate, I think RFERL and Voice of America are doing the right thing. Um, Voice of America has a very strong radio service to Africa, um, but not to Latin America. Uh, they have very little radio or television to Latin America. Um, the USAGM has an Arabic network, uh, but it's up against very strong competition with other networks, most of which have a rather anti-US flavor. Uh, the US doesn't really have anything um, aimed at Latin America or Africa uh, like RT, uh, which operates in five languages or uh, China Global Television. As a matter of fact, um, USAGM is actually barred by law from doing that because it's not supposed to compete with US commercial television networks. And you have CNN and Fox that have international distribution. And so USAGM is not supposed to compete with that. Now, if you watch CNN or Fox, um, you will probably get the impression the United States is one you know, ongoing catastrophe. But nonetheless, um, uh, uh, USAGM is not empowered to get out there and, and, and compete with them to present another view of the United States. Could I ask you the same question, except specifically for what you think perhaps the U.S. government could be doing? You know, what, what could other branches of the govern, government and our foreign partners uh, be doing right now? Well, I think that Western governments should be involved in much more aggressive advocacy for their points of view. Um, <clears throat> you know, Western, Western countries, United States, um, European countries uh, dislike very much the idea of propaganda. And, and God bless us. I mean, we shouldn't do propaganda uh, to the extent that propaganda means um, putting out false information. But I don't think that advocating for, you know, what Western countries offer advocating for our liberties and so forth is propaganda. I think it's it's just true, uh, and we shouldn't be afraid to to say what we believe. Um, and while we should tell the truth, there's a lot of truth to tell. There's a lot of things we could say and reveal about the way that um, our adversaries operate and the um, the long term dangers of what they do and the short term dangers of what they do that I don't think we really um, have a tradition, a recent tradition of doing it all. Uh, it doesn't all have to be done by, by government officials. Uh, much of it is actually probably done better, not by government officials, but by non-government actors, by um, uh, NGOs, by democracy activists of various sorts who are very courageous and very active and do um, uh, a lot uh, but but what they lack is scale. They don't have a government behind them that can buy you know a hundred thousand dollars of Facebook ads, uh, or that can set up a huge rally, or that can you know buy advertising in in newspapers, um, which Russia has. Uh, 
Um, uh, this is not expensive, uh, but uh, we just uh, do not devote very much to advocacy, advocacy that has a sharp edge. Um, we, um, we do a lot of good things around the world um, and often get credit for it. But when it comes to getting out there and slinging it out on social media and, uh, and pointing out the, the lies and inconsistencies of our adversaries, um, it doesn't seem to be these days in our DNA, although it was in the past. Which agency of the US government do you think should be leading these kinds of efforts? Well, there's something for everyone. I think the most important thing would be to have someone on top, probably at the level of the National Security Council, who would be able to oversee and coordinate these efforts. But, you know, the Pentagon's got a lot of money uh, and a lot of officers who understand this problem and have um, a lot of good technical capabilities and including cyber capabilities to do this. Uh, the intelligence agencies understand the power of information operations very well, particularly to specific small groups of people that can be effective in one way or another. The State Department um, funds some um, international uh, uh, campaigning uh, or information, they call it public diplomacy, um, that could have a sharper edge. Uh, there's a global engagement center within the State Department that's, that understands, I think, particularly well how this can be done. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development uh, is, uh, is active in this area. But I think what's lacking is a sense of coordination and scale and being able to transfer that scale to, uh, uh, to non-government actors um, who believe in democracy and who are very, very courageous. You know, so Tom, you're painting a picture here, which is um, not especially optimistic, but do you see any glimmers of, of hope going forward for the West and for uh, the emerging world? Oh, sure. Um, despite all the things that I study and all the things I think about, I am an optimist. I definitely think that uh, the the approaches of our adversaries uh, toward stomping down on uh, on freedom and invading countries and and trying to uh, trigger an emotional responses um, that play to the the worst instincts of people uh, are not going to succeed in the long run. Uh, we see in in country after country, including in Latin America, including in Africa, including in the Middle East, um, uh, movement after movement that is anti-corruption, pro-democracy, and so forth. And a lot of that is being held down by sheer you know, brutality and technology um, uh, that authoritarians exert. But uh, I think people want to live in freedom. I think people know ultimately that they would uh, much rather uh, live in the United States than live in Russia uh, or live in West Europe than live in Russia. And so I think it's going to be uh, a long and awful struggle, but I have very little doubt that 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 um, that ultimately uh, people want to live in freedom and they understand what freedom is. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for that perspective. Um, before we let you go, Tom, um, I understand that you're working on a new book. Could you give us just a a, a quick uh, a quick glimpse at, as to what that's all about? Yeah, this book is going to look at Russian influence operations that have not been successful uh, or not successful uh, at some point, even though they may have recovered later on. We tend to think that uh, whenever the Russians try something in, in terms of information or influence, they always succeed. Uh, but I'll be looking at uh, a variety of things like the uh, Nord Stream pipeline, which they, they worked very, very hard on. And now that is uh, literally dead in the water, and not only because of the Ukraine, Ukraine invasion, but because of other things. I'll be writing about the Sputnik vaccine, which looked like it would um, pay enormous benefits to Russia by saving the world from COVID when Western vaccines were, were still very slow in coming out. That didn't work out that way for them. And in different specific countries, um, in, in Northern Macedonia, in South Africa, in Ecuador, 
um, interesting places that I spent some time in now uh, where uh, Russian influence operations to varying degrees um, in support of various leaders and movements did not work out as the Kremlin had expected. All right. Well, that sounds like it's uh, going to be an important contribution. And Tom Kent, thank you so much for being a return guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Thank you. Pleasure. See you later. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.